Today I have a lovely gentleman on the podcast. His name is Mauricio Gonzalez Aranda. Hope I have that pronounced correctly, <laughs> Mauricio. Um, you're a documentary filmmaker and a writer. Um, you have a background in physics uh, from Princeton University, and you're now a filmmaker and a pretty well established filmmaker. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, firstly, we discovered your work um, through a Kickstarter program, which is entitled My Great Uncle's Music. Now, for those of you watching me on YouTube, you're going to see me looking over to my computer a lot because there's so much information here about Mauricio. And you're really interesting because, well, the projects you've covered are fascinating. But this we will start, I think, maybe with the Kickstarter program and then we'll go backwards and talk about how you got into filmmaking with a background in physics. How did that all happen? So just give us an overview of the most important story that I want to get across in today's podcast, My Great Uncle's Music, because there's um, a deadline on that Kickstarter project, which is what date? I think it's October. It's 20 Saturday, this episode, October 28th, I believe. Okay, so we're just publishing this the day before the deadline is at work. So if any of you can support his Kickstarter, it would really help this amazing story to come forth. So can you just give us an overview of this project? Of course. Um, well, I think like to follow your approach, I'll go backwards. The The Kickstarter, uh, I launched the Kickstarter because I need to raise $20,000 to be able to film the climax scene of this film. And that is a scene in Carnegie Hall. Uh, the documentary is about a cellist who discovers that his great, great uncle uh, used to be famous 100 years ago. And uh, he was played across the world in the big philharmonics. And then for whatever reason, or for whatever complex series of reasons, he fell out of the standard repertoire and then uh, was forgotten by the world. And since there were no recordings, like he, his music truly uh, disappeared until the great, great nephew found an archive in Switzerland found mountains of music, 252 works, completed works, including eight operas, four symphonies, tons of chamber music, and newspaper clippings as well, showing that he had been played everywhere. So then he decided to begin a lifelong project of bringing that music back to life. And um, also along with all that, there were diaries. Um, he wrote, uh, he kept a diary since he was 14 until he was uh, 81. And he wrote very regularly. So you, we have his life story there, which is fascinating in itself. Like he was born into uh, an aristocratic Russian family uh, who had ties to Tchaikovsky, for example. Like he would come over to the house and play on the piano. And they were just truly like at the epicenter of, of the musical, like the higher echelons of music. And, you know, through his life, he went from being that to like dying, uh, lonely and relatively poor in Switzerland, which is it's just a fascinating journey. And anyway, I've been filming to be as the great, great nephew for three, four years now. And he's gone from being un, like ignored by the world because everyone just kind of rolls their eyes when he tells them I've got this great, great uncle who's a genius. And everyone's like, well, that's just your opinion, man. That's your, yeah. <laughs> that's your relative. And finally that he's been working so long on this. I've only been filming it for the last four years, but he's basically been working on it for 15. And he's finally gonna play in Carnegie Hall, arguably the world stage, um, his great, great uncle's music, which is the perfect end to the film. And I just didn't expect that it would be so expensive to film there, simply to film there. It's um, $17,255. Uh, I mean, who'd have thought? Yeah, who'd plus have thought? Kickstarter feeds and so on. So I, I wasn't quite ready for that. And I'm also independently making this, this uh, documentary. I don't have a big studio or anything like that. So I decided the best way would be to crowdsource given the short deadline. And, and here we are, you know, we're. Well, I have to say, I've visited your website and looked at the trailer for that film and the music that is played in that trailer is absolutely beautiful. I mean, the cellist who plays his uncle's music and the beautiful music, it's very romantic. It's, it reminds, it just gives me pictures of, of artists traveling to the Amalfi Coast in Italy, you know, that type of period in the, maybe the forties, fifties, thirties, that kind of period. It's most beautiful sounding music. 
So I encourage anyone just to, um, I'll have the links in the show description of both your website and the Kickstarter program for people to click through and have a look at the, um, the trailer. And when do you hope to have the film fully finished, provided it all works out with Kickstarter? I think uh, release date would be 2024, sometime in 2024, okay. because um, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the editing. Uh, I need to figure out, even though I've shot mostly everything, I need to figure out how to best tell this story in conjunction with the diaries, which is in itself a whole uh, writing challenge, I suppose. That's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, it's very so comprehensive. Yeah, so I think it'll take me another year to figure that out, um, okay. even though we've shot most of it. Okay. Well, when it comes out, tell us and we'll promote it for you. Absolutely. Now, on your website, we'll turn to those other topics on your website in a moment. But first, I just want to refer to your background. You have a background in physics, and now you're in filmmaking. How did that transition happen? Um, I, it does surprise a lot of people. But to me, it was just one of those things that I always had an interest in film, even though I was studying physics. Um, I just personally thought it was a better use of uh, my degree to study physics, which was my second passion. And then I could later on learn film by myself as mm -hmm. opposed to the, the converse. I didn't see myself like picking up a quantum physics textbook at 9 p.m. as light reading. You know? um, yeah. So then I, I decided to study physics and I actually did give it a shot. I, I interned one summer in CERN in Switzerland in that particle accelerator, thinking that if I, if I don't like it here, then I won't like it anywhere. And, um, and I, well, I did like it. It just wasn't, it wasn't exciting enough for me to picture myself uh, for the next 50 years running simulations on a computer. Yeah. Uh, whereas film for me is, it's, it's, um, I love meeting people. That's probably why I ended up gravitating towards documentaries. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also just uh, a way of expressing myself that's um, kind of- But it's of discovering the human stories that are hidden away from, the, you know, in quiet corners really and bringing them to the fore, I'd imagine. That whole right. creative process, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And um, I mean, I, I, I think there's, tremendous beauty in, in um, nonfiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think lately also when I've been writing, I, I gravitate towards nonfiction, just kind of like parsing my own experiences and, and making sense of them. Um, and it, those stories usually revolve around meeting someone. So it's not mm -hmm. just like I'm walking outside on a rainy day. It's, it's more like this person is wild. Like what is happening here? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the common denominator then uh, that really is my interest but on top of that there's also the visual element and the, mm -hmm. or not the visual but the cinematic element I suppose the fact that you can bring in visuals and diegetic and non-diegetic audio and all these things to create a, a very visceral response in, in the person seated in that cinema um, and, and what it, what is the ingredient in filmmaking that makes it exceptional beyond mediocre like what makes a good film or what makes the documentary we'll focus on documentaries uh, documentaries uh, i don't know if i can answer that um in fact i was just thinking the other day that when i was 19 or or 22 essentially when i was graduating high school or when i was graduating college i had such sure opinions about what made good cinema yeah and just the older i get the <laughs> the less sure I am or maybe the less I care necessarily about certain constraints or rules that I had come up with um so I think it's 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 also a matter of um what you're going through in life I suppose like um the, the films that touch you at a young age won't necessarily touch you at, like in the middle of your life you know, or towards the I suppose it, it comes down to the human story and I think maybe that's you know since the whole COVID pandemic maybe it's people are looking for that connection and the more naturally I mean the style of documentaries that I've noticed there's been a significant change in the last five ten years where it's gone really raw and very kind of natural almost the way that right. documentaries have been filmed would you agree with that yeah Not very I, contrived I think it's 
Yeah, maybe. I, but at the same time, I mean, I do agree with you, but at the same time, um, it's like documentaries, uh, the obvious tool uh, for documentaries is to champion some sort of political or human rights agenda. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't have to be necessarily around the story, just more like an issue. But obviously, the better the story, the better that issue is put out there. It's portrayed, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think that um, there there is this inherent or like maybe more like inherited um, knowledge in audiences about like an uh, illiteracy when it comes to film. Uh, everyone just grew up watching it, so everyone knows what makes a good film. And I think at some point, perhaps people started to look for something more than just the f- fiction feature film. And that's about the time that cameras became kind of widely accessible to everyone. And that's I think that's why there was a boom in documentary that suddenly we could get access to more stories that were maybe not more complex, but definitely outside of the of the molds Scope. of fiction. Mm-hmm film yeah. mm-hmm. and and coupled with that there is that curiosity of everyone to just see someone else's life I think that's why streaming right now is so popular it doesn't even have to have a story right it just needs to be a window into someone else's life we and, become a society of watchers watching each other in a sense right and I think that's uh, if I can postulate then documentary inhabits both of those worlds the the cinematic world but also this this voyeuristic world uh, and and that rawness that you speak of is this kind of like a telltale sign of 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 authenticity because it's someone that's traveled over there and with lightweight equipment to try to get you that story versus like a whole production around you um, and I think that's what yeah and I mean looking looking at your website here you have um, a word for human which is a documentary all centered around a library in Denmark and it's a fascinating look into the life and times of that library. I did encourage anyone actually to visit it and I'll, as I said I'll have the links in the show description below for people to click through but can you talk to us firstly how did that documentary come about and how did it come together for you? Was it a difficult task? Was it challenging? Um, no I think it I mean yeah it was difficult but at the same time I I was uh, 23 when I started that and I just, I had this, I moved to Denmark to work with a, with a really special group of people in particular with Joshua Oppenheimer who directed the act of killing at Look of Silence. Mm-hmm. Um, I graduated from physics, I didn't know what to do with myself and then I reached out to my greatest idol. He replied, he said, come work with me. Uh, funny enough, he actually studied physics himself before he switched into film. Um, and then, uh, so I went over there and I just was trying to absorb as much knowledge as I could from him and from Sina Berger Sorensen, his producer, and then the rest of the people there. Um, and and they were also really encouraging. They were, they were actually, actually like putting aside some days of the week for me to just go try to find a story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, and I just had this, um, I've always, I suppose, um, really been drawn to the like romanticization of life uh kind of like cinema cinema en paradiso that's mm-hmm. a film that's quite beautiful to me because it's just about this really cozy world around film and maybe like the relationship between the grandfather and the and the grandson and the passing on of like this love of film and knowledge and I kind of wanted to do something similar. Just can I find some sort of librarian that's teaching a a, a random person at the library? Or like, just, you meet that wise old man, and then he finds some some joy in life in the younger person. And I started to go around Copenhagen looking at all the libraries to see if I could find that. And um, I couldn't because librarians are actually quite like uh, they're more administrative than I pictured. I picture them like putting books back into the shelves or something, but in reality, they're behind the office on a desk, um, working with like a social workers or if they're a researcher librarian, then they're truly like an academic. There really isn't any kind of human interaction really. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then at some point I just decided that I, I was still interested in that warmth, that feeling, that like uh, romanticization of literature and that I would do it in an abstract way in this beautiful building called the Black Diamond. 
which has imposing architecture and amazing architecture actually just yeah, to see it, the there it's amazing it, it was an amazing vehicle to to channel those those emotions that i wanted to express and and i decided to create a mosaic of a film that followed different people and jumped from moment to moment rather than like a specific narrative it was almost as if the goal of the film was to to from the perspective of the building of all the beautiful conversations that it experiences and here's just a snapshot of them and and you jump from them thematically so you jump from it's it's like from the viewer's perspective who's i'm not educated in film but from a viewer's point of view it was so fascinating just to see those conversations it was like you're looking at behind the scenes what goes on because as a person who would enter the library just going in there as a normal person off the street you don't get a privy eye to that fascinating right. look behind the scenes fascinating and you also have an interesting series called the bar or bar talk i won't say the bar talk bar talk b-a-r talk and it's available on youtube again the link will be in the description below and you describe it as documenting social life in new york very different now to what we've just been speaking about so what motivated this creation um well i let me see how i can tie it back into because i think it's the same interest as the word for human um like i i suppose i'm quite interested in in archiving things in archiving um i i guess that's what all documentarians do but when i was making a word for human i found myself really drawn to um the knowledge within the sentences mm -hmm. um like the, there were plenty of conversations between two really learned individuals. And then I almost wish I could include that whole conversation in the film, but that wasn't the point of the film. Uh, how can I distill it was the point. Um, and I, I've always been drawn towards, um, yeah, the, I think it's simply, it's not so okay what i'm trying to say is that it's not really about meeting people in this case it's more about the the collective knowledge of of the of the city uh it's it's anthropological in scope in the sense that we want to capture all these different conversations that are happening right now um or i know how to explain it I, when my my co-creator and i were at the bar uh like any tipsy person we really started flying in conversation and we and then an hour went by and then we looked back on what we had talked about and i suppose in a really arrogant way we're like wow that was an incredible conversation <laughs> what if that had been recorded then we could like share it with people um of course we were half joking um but we really felt what is that conversation with in all the people at the bar like next to us there they must be going through the same thing uh, they must have reached that point, a critical mass where they transitioned away from uh, catching up or like talking about what happened at work. And then they started to really talk about their dreams and their frustrations and their, uh, their, their musings about life. And then we thought that probably all those things are colored by their background. Like in the case of my friend and I, Andrew Mullen, who's the one that's doing the series with me, we're both writers and so we really began to riff on writing and literature with a capital L um, and, and that took us uh, in really interesting directions and we we thought well if the people next to us are um, music musicians uh, then that probably means that that our conversation is colored by music in some way yes uh, <laughs> true and, or maybe we were completely wrong and maybe everyone ends up talking about the same things after a certain point, but that would also be an interesting discovery uh, about the human condition uh, that we all kind of shed away our backgrounds and then just become people who are uh, talking about the universality of the, of the human experience. And, and also to watch debates between people, differing opinions. <laughs> that's, right. that's a fascinating one just to see like, okay, who's the most fired up about some topic, you know? Right. Um, the passion. And, uh, yeah. And so we just wanted to then uh, do something a la Humans of New York, where it's just building a collection of stories um, one week at a time, inviting people from different jobs. And then after a year has gone by, then maybe we have uh, 50 episodes of, of, you know, take your pick. You want to hear a doctor at the bar? Here you go. You want to hear a, 
a janitor. It's a new view in your doctor. How about that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you can find it on YouTube, and I'd recommend anyone to have a look at it. It's it's such if you've got um, a, just an interest in the story of humanity in a sense from day to day. It's really interesting just to see how people think, how they express themselves, the use of language, if you're really into the use of language, um, just the general expression. So when it comes to filmmaking and music, is music an important component to use in your filmmaking when you're putting the edits together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, I would say that A Word for Human is, is only successful because of the music in it. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually spent a year working on that score. Uh, me, there were two composers. Uh, they they worked together, uh, Christian um, and Adam. And we, I wanted to create a, a score that had a different uh, different tone or a different character, depending on what person was on screen. Like there were three main people uh, in that film, even though it wasn't about those people. There were three people that we follow that allowed us to go into all these different moments mm -hmm. and I wanted each of them to have a different color um, in terms of music mm -hmm. and that meant we we created a very eclectic score but that also meant we had to experiment a lot try a lot and it, the score couldn't be also too cloying or uh, mm -hmm. sappy or over the top otherwise it would I mean you can't have super intense music if you're only talking about books you know like <laughs> <laughs> doesn't that help doesn't that help exactly um yeah. and we also and, it, and precisely because the subject matter is dry uh it did need a, a musical motor in order to be able to to push you on to the next moment and so yeah. on yeah yeah to just lift it lift the the atmosphere yeah. and what in your filmmaking life is the most interesting and probably is the most challenging i mean you go out on the field filming okay that be a library it could be the cellist that we spoke about my great uncle's music and or is it the editing process is most challenging which would you say is the most challenging no i think for me it's um and i haven't figured this this out yet but for me the most challenging thing is to not want to uh, impose my own vision onto what I'm recording um, because then I, that ends up being a not really the authentic nature of the, th of the stuff you're recording yeah. mm -hmm. but perhaps more importantly from a pragmatic standpoint uh, you're also ruining you're like trapping yourself you're ruining the material because you're putting some some really strict constraints on it and then three years later when you realize, ah, that actually wasn't what it was about, you don't have that kind of flexibility or you didn't capture, the bandwidth wasn't wide enough for what you captured. Yeah. So that you end up being trapped with this vision, which is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that I, it wasn't really an issue for me necessarily in the first film, I Work for Human, because it it actually is all about vision. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's conceptual, the film. Um, but in the second one, I've been filming now with Tobias for four years. And I think when I first started, I had very, very uh, like strict views on what this story should have been. And those mm -hmm. views have been changing year by year, which means that, you know, I should have just started filming as openly as possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. To be a, yeah. a bit more concrete, for example, I had very strict uh, uh, cinematic or like cin cinematographical constraints almost like a dogma I want to shoot in this way mm -hmm. um, and at the time it made total sense for me um, I wanted to shoot like very tightly uh, like over 50 millimeter millimeters maybe like plus 70 and I wanted to be handheld and I thought those things made sense because that means that you are always you always feel the materials really closely like if the thing becomes tactile and if you're talking about music and nostalgia, then it's important to have this quality in what you're recording. Yeah. And then that would be contrasted with the story of the past, which would have been archival in nature and therefore kind of like very removed and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it turns out that uh, I probably should just been filming wider angles the whole time. Like that's a very yeah. Yeah. practical uh, necessity I needed. And then it's not in that original material. 
And it's not a big deal because I've been filming a lot and we end up needing only very little of that initial material, but it was just like an important lesson for me to not go in there thinking I already know the solution to the story from the start. But I presume there's a balance in it because you've got to be in on your work as you're filming, but you've also to kind of stand back and not get too involved in the process of telling the subjects that you're filming what to do because you want it to be natural. So there must be some kind of tension there trying to find that balance. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably what separates um, better directors than me. They just um, either the flexibility with which they adapt or their instinct being right from the start or something like this. But yeah. at the same time, uh, I, I feel like from my, in my experience, after having seen all, all the films that went through uh, Final Cut for Real, the production company in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. everyone ends up redefining their film, even the best directors. Uh, so I it's, think it, it's, it's like everybody that you would speak to, will say you're speaking, speaking to a poet, they'll say, I probably, a few poets that I've looked into, they burned their first group of poems that they wrote in dis utter disgust because they're rediscovering themselves and redefining themselves before they really write what they view as their proper poetry. So I suppose everybody in the creative arts can have that experience in the sense of what was in the beginning is now a new evolution turning into something different right. and new and fresh. Yeah. So you mentioned you're a writer as well. Can you speak about your writings? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I um, well, like I mentioned lately, I've been trying to do some nonfiction um, a series of encounters that I've experienced in New York. Uh, and they, um, funny enough, I think they, they've all started to show that uh, besides besides it being about this weird interaction with someone, which is inherently, I think, kind of eccentric and, and uh, fun. Uh, I think the underlying themes so far have been about um, the, I suppose, the nature of like, whether art is transactional or not. Um, yeah. You meet, if you're a documentarian and you meet someone um, and you want to write, make a story about them, there's a very clear transaction here going on. You, you are getting the story from them and they are getting either attention or they are getting uh, a friend often, like a, a way to process their experience even. If something is going on, uh, yeah. there is a transaction. And, and I've always found that to be quite tricky. Uh, like how do you not exploit that essentially? Uh, how do you uh, do it ethically? How do you not abuse this? Uh, because you also have a lot of power with the camera and so on. Yeah, yeah. And I think funny enough, the, the, I keep saying funny enough, I didn't realize I was relying so much on this expression, but uh, when, when you write, uh, when you are writing nonfiction, the very same thing is happening uh, because you are, you are experiencing something. And at some point in this conversation, you realize, you know what, this would be a good story. Mm -hmm. And, and once that flip is switched, then you, are you still experiencing the moment authentically, genuinely, or are you now behaving so that the story will pan out? <laughs> if I'm right now, this leads into, um, if I'm right, quantum physics, where, you know, the observer influences. Oh, yeah. That's you know, that, transition. yeah, that is, isn't that kind of connected somehow? Um in some ways, I'm not uh, educated enough to fully go into that depth of discussion, but it's it's also, I suppose, about a person's frame of reference. Yes. I mean, a person's frame of reference, the environment that they're experiencing, whether it's from the filmmaker's standpoint or the person who's the subject matter, you know, that has a lot of influence as well. And I suppose that influences directors so the more experience you can have the broader your frame of reference is therefore you've more to pull from to create a better product at the end of it perhaps right yeah i mean i, I think everything you said makes sense to me uh especially the last part they i think a, an experienced director has a cache of experience and then they just are able to pull the right experience out and apply it to what they see happening yeah. uh, and I mean, th that's certainly true. The older I get, the, the more I know when to interrupt something. Mm. Um, 
I used to be quite afraid of interrupting, not disturbing what's there, but there, there are times when clearly you need to intervene or, or, or there's some technical problem and rather than let it play out, you need to stop it then and you will still be able to recapture the moment later on. Um, but, but the observer effect, collapsing uh, an experience simply because you are, are, are observing or interacting, I think that's, that's definitely true. Um, and, and, uh, and just because you're collapsing something, I suppose is the key interesting thing to me. It doesn't make, that's not what makes it inauthentic or not. I think it's more how, like, and it's also not the intention. I just mean it's how you wrestle with this with this collapse. I suppose that's what makes it genuine. Yeah, and I suppose from a human perspective, meaning situational, it's like finding that balance. It co it's coming back to finding the balance of where you are. And I suppose, speaking personally, speaking um, over years of personal discovery, I'll label it like that. It's centering oneself and being very comfortable with oneself it starts there and then you're able to enter your work with more authenticity i'm wondering if somebody was listening to this podcast and they're really interested in the world of filmmaking what would be the greatest piece of advice you would give somebody um i, I don't know I, I haven't quite figured out filmmaking myself you know i'm, I'm really talking you're in process myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. if I had to give advice, um, it's quite generic, but it's like the only sort of compass I have. And that is um, just being true to your to your instincts and what you find interesting, because that's the actually really tricky thing about uh, editing a film and getting feedback. You start to get everyone's interests thrown at you and and because you're so desperate for guidance, it's very easy to take that interest and then apply it to your own stuff and, and hide behind the excuse of this is what other people find interesting. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes there's there's a lot of uh, truth to what they're saying, but um, then you risk creating something that is is a lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and. And it doesn't have to be that dramatic, you know. It doesn't have to be like you are you are misrepresenting someone entirely. It's simply whether or not what angle you you choose for your story. For example, you you found an angle initially interesting, and then if someone tells you no, but you know what, go in this direction, it's quite easy to do that because uh, it's the same material and it's only a slight pivot for you. But yeah. then that ends up being like like you're a little bit of an imposter, or you just you defrauded yourself, yeah. and I. I, I spoke with when I was making a word for human. There was there's a an author in that film uh, who I, whom I really like. His name is Kim Leine. Uh, he's this uh, Norwegian Danish author, and um, he it seems like he was wrestling with this himself his whole life, and that's why he was a fan of Tolstoy. He said because he felt like that was um, the truest form of writing he's ever encountered. Like something about wars for him in his opinion something about wars was tapping into what he called like the the reptilian part of your brain yes that, yeah that men find war beautiful and and i saw that clip and i was going that took me back when i saw that and i was thinking hang on a minute now i need to think deeper about this concept yeah. and when you it's the weirdest thing to hear it's shocking to hear it first and then you step back and you say hold on now <laughs> Yeah, that that took me back. Yeah, and then he quoted Hemingway saying that Hemingway's whole bit was to try to write one true sentence, and yeah. it's harder than you think. And yeah. I think uh, in in something as as nebulous and tricky as as filmmaking or writing or any form of art, to have some very simple guiding principle like that that's quite helpful. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's very good to hear all sides of a story. You know, some people say there's two sides to the coin. <laughs> no, there isn't. There's many sides. You know, when you think of storytelling, so it's to kind of try and understand it from all perspectives. Now, before we complete this episode, I just want to remind people just that if you've time, hop over to the Kickstarter campaign about my great uncle's music. It's a wonderful story. The music is beautiful. 
and it deserves to be supported because a world without the arts, we saw it through the pandemic, it ain't worth living in a world without the arts. We need them so badly. And this quality of music that this Kickstarter is supporting is beautiful. It's utterly beautiful. Um, so beyond the Kickstarter, how can people reach out to you if they want to learn more about you? Is it just your website? Are you active on social yeah. media? Yeah, my, my website is a good way. There's my emails there. It's um, my name essentially contact at Mauricio Gonzalez Saranda.com. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'm also on social media. Um, Great. Yeah, they, they can always reach out and, and hear more about uh, my great great uncle's music. And because uh, there's just so much to unpack there uh, about the composer Leopold or even the cellist Tobias. Both of them share the same last name, Van der Paals. Yeah. And, it's a wonderful story. Um, it's a beautiful story. It. it seems like, yeah, we're out of time. But, you know, yeah. they can always talk more later on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, you know, as things happen with this documentary series, come back to us, we'd love to hear more. Because that, there's so many people doing amazing work that are unheard of. And this is just one creative gentleman's life you're covering. How many more is there? that have this most beautiful artistic skill that we all need to have. You know, it's a beauty in our life. It's the sweetness of life. So um, it's my great uncle's music. So keep an eye out for that one. My great, great. My, my great, great, great uncle's music. Okay, great, it's two great. Two generations uncle. removed. And I also yeah. like the, the play on words, you know, like yeah. he's saying it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, good. That's good. Well, a pleasure to have you on the podcast and keep in touch. Thank you so much. <laughs>